And hello there, very good evening to you and welcome to Newsline Live, although tonight it is a recording. Today, of course, is International Women's Day. And uh, to mark that, we've got uh, a wonderful guest who will tell us all about the challenges uh, and perhaps joys of being a woman. Who knows? Let's find out, shall we? Our guest tonight is uh, Radhika Kumaraswamy, who is the former Under Secretary General, Special Representative on Children and Armed Conflict. She's right here with us. Very good evening to you, Radhika. Welcome to good the program. Good evening, Faraz. Good evening. Um, so, International Women's Day today. Um, is there any point marking it today? Shouldn't every day be a special day for women? Well, the history of International Women's Day is an interesting one. Uh, it was after a, a, a garment factory in the United States that was burnt down uh, and uh, workers came out on strike. Uh, and it was a women, it became a big women's strike. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the marking of International Women's Day began from there and then it spread to, to, to time. Mm -hmm. But it is interesting that today you have, you know, rock concerts and I saw all kinds of things on International Women's Day. But its initial uh, one was for dispossessed women, vulnerable women. That was the focus mm. uh, of Women's Day. Do you get the feeling that? You know, today probably there'll be a big song and dance about it. Um, our colleagues in the morning would have spoken about it on radio and so on, and various events would have been held around the country, uh, uh, indeed around the, the world. And then from tomorrow, they'll just forget all about it for the balance 364 days until it all rolls on again. Well, it's true in the sense that. Um we commemorate it now much more like spectacle and fanfare uh, and uh, not really uh, have any follow on from it. But I must say that all aspects uh, of women uh, issues, they don't really move forward. Now we take political representation, mm. uh, it's stuck at 5%. Violence against women is not getting mm. better. It was going to be my next question about how much has Sri Lanka progressed in terms of women's rights? Well, like the internet, Sri Lanka is a lot like the international system. Um, it has uh, frameworks uh, that created by the various cabinets. It has all kinds of programs, but the difference is not being felt really on the ground. Um, and I think that's true internationally also, mm. that the actual differences on the ground are not there. And, and in Sri Lanka in, in particular, um, violence against women is quite high. Uh, it's spoken a lot about and so on. But in, in reality, how, what steps are being taken to address it, to uh, perhaps e eradicate the whole thing and so on? What, what real concrete steps are being taken? So from experience around the world, mm. The first thing um, you need is good laws. Now we don't have good laws, there are certain areas such as rape laws and even the domestic violence are all really out of date. Mm. The second thing that you want is a criminal justice system that is sensitive. We definitely don't have that. We have police that send people back to their families because they don't want to break up marriages. Uh, there are rape cases are not followed up or investigated. So the criminal justice system is not at all sensitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have to have the third thing, you have to get support the victim as to what they want to do, how they want to deal with uh, the issues, give them some sense of starting life again. And in that, there are a lot of NGOs that are around to help, mm. but still the, the funding is low for it. There's a sort of a campaign, I suppose, uh, that uh, uh, prevents women in Sri Lanka from going to work abroad if their children are, sort of, I think, under five years old. Mm. A, is that a good thing? B, isn't it a bad thing? Because surely the woman must be able to choose whenever she wants to go to work, depending on her circumstances, her needs, and so on. Um, I must say I'm on the side of choice. Right. Uh, because I think there is a tradition in Sri Lanka of being very paternalistic toward women mm -hmm. uh, and making decisions for them. 
Now, when I was at the Human Rights Commission in Sri Lanka, I, I, uh, tr we tried to get in place some practices with mm. regard to women going abroad, uh, such as training them, uh, such as making sure that they're not abused, uh, getting, et cetera, you know, to create frameworks. Yeah. When I talk to these women, many of them go, first because you know, this idea of saving the family, the marriage sometimes is broken down. Husband mm. is alcoholic, no one is earning. Mm. Um, and so they're going to make money to actually bring up the children. Mm. So it's not that they're leaving an idyllic situation and <coughs> going abroad yeah. and sort of doing something extremely uh, ira you know, unfair or irrational by their children. They're doing it for their children. Many of them. Then what, what would you say about the social impact of not having a mother around? So then what you have to do, and this is true in many areas, is that we have to, even with this economic crisis, the lack of attention hmm. to social needs of the population is very important. Hmm. Hmm. And, and I think um, especially those uh, who are in a situation where they give unpaid uh, care for families. Mm. So I think the state has a responsibility if these women go abroad, social workers to come and uh, come into the house, check on the children. There are whole co kinds of things that can be put in place mm. to mitigate this going abroad. How many light years away do you think Sri Lanka is? In, because in terms of, uh, it all goes back to the question of uh, funding. Mm. Uh, with uh, Sri Lanka's uh, economy so mismanaged and we saw the uh, protesters come, come up on the mm. streets, Aragale, uh, deep, deep unhappiness. The, the average Sri Lankan hasn't done this in, uh, since independence probably. Mm. And you know, uh, in, all, in all this sort of Arab Spring moment kind of thing, uh, we're all down to money, mismanagement, mm. and corruption and whatever. Mm. Uh, how, how will how do you see this progressing in terms of the fact that we don't really have much money? Well, I think, you know, there's a whole debate raging about the IMF and fools rush in where angels mm. fear to tread, so I'm not going to argue with that. But regardless of what is done at the macroeconomic level, mm. the macroeconomic fundamentals, there's going to be hardship socially, mm. right? Mm. So my sense is that there's no planning for that hardship. Mm. There's no planning that perhaps we can try and get money from other sources uh, to deal with some of the problems women are going to face, mm. that children are going to face. Now, one of the things we are campaigning for, many of us, is to f provide midday meals for children. Now, it's true they can't take it from the budget, maybe, mm. but at least try to raise funds from World Food Program or from private donors to have a fund for at least two years. Mm to have women fed in schools. So the malnutrition rates go up, as well as the fact that children will go into schools. Mm. So we have to have people imaginatively planning for the social sector, for social protection. There's nobody doing that in Sri Lanka. Mm. Um, there are a lot of private charities uh, who are very good people who are doing what they can in their small way, mm. but the state is not planning for it. Make, maybe they can use the private charities. Right. But there is no plan for the social protection sector. They do things here and there, but like they are so planning for the IMF and the macroeconomic fundamentals in a very de deliberative sense, there's nobody who has been assigned the duty to do that with regard to social protection and the hardship that people are going to face. Hmm. Lest I, I don't want to drag you into this, but I, I couldn't help but uh, wonder when you were talking about planning that uh, no less a person than our president has said that there is no forward plan it needs to be all redone all over again um, so you know I don't want to sound like Gerald Ruckman and all that business <laughs> but um, what about women in politics though mm. this is uh, for a country that produced the first female prime minister in the world mm. And I don't know whether Chandrika Kumartung was the first female president of the world, mm. but uh, certainly top-notch jobs. Um, it, does, it appears to me that Sri Lanka is way, lagging way behind in terms of women's representation. We have 5% of women in parliament. 5% right. of parliament is women. Is that enough? 
No, not at all. I mean, we, the, according to the CEDAW Convention uh, Committee, the elimination of uh, discrimination against women, that there must should be 33% of women to make a difference on women's issues. Right. That it's only at that level will there any be really any difference when it comes to women's issues. Mm -hmm. And now, in recent years, they're pushing for 50%. Mm. So we're at 5%. So you can imagine where we are. Uh, and uh, so I think it's very important to get women into politics. So the idea of quotas have come up, which is highly contested. Uh, but it is the only way to, in some ways to try and deal with this issue, to have some kind of quota for women, at least for the first few, uh, f five years or ten years, so women get used mm. to the idea and people get used to the idea of seeing women. Now in the Panchayat system in India, yeah. they they did this and initially uh, it was wives and daughters who came forward. This is what will happen if you put quotas sometimes. Yeah. The wives and daughters of existing politicians. But once people see women doing this, see this as a lifestyle option, hmm. then you find the second generation of leaders of the Panchayat system were women who were independent who became very good leaders. Mm -hmm. So you have to go through that first phase until people realize they can do this job and can come and uh, work. Mm -hmm. um, you've preempted that question as well. Uh, that I was going <laughs> to say, what, what about what's the experience in other countries yeah. uh, deploying this sort of quota system? Well, India has it at the panchayat level. And I think the quota system does work. But of course, the United States is completely opposed to quotas, even on race issues. Uh, but at least if you don't have quotas, uh, sort of affirmative action, where if people are equally qualified, you choose the woman, mm. uh, is some of the things. But it's also raising awareness <clears throat> among the political parties, you know, that, that actually having women politicians is a good idea. But what has happened? I mean, let's be frank. What is the profile that some of these political leaders and politicians are having for MPs? It's the local thug. More mm. and more, the local thug is the one who's becoming a parliamentarian. Mm. So where do women fit? Educated women or whatever. So the profile chosen by the parliamentarian's leadership, uh, by political party leadership, has to change. I've noticed, uh, you know, on the campaign trail, there are quite a lot of uh, women involved in, in the campaign. Mm. They come around when it's the door-to-door -door business mm. and uh, distributing leaflets and so on. There's quite a number of women, but y you then realize when it comes to polling day that there aren't as many on, on the nomination list. No. Women are very active politically in some ways, and they're very conscious politically. Mm. But they are not given positions by male leadership. Uh, so that's... One is that, that there's the idea that they are not given uh, leadership positions by the male leadership of the party. But there's also the question that women are not, um, uh, also because of this pervasive kind of nearly criminal atmosphere in which a lot of this campaigning is done, mm. uh, they are turned off. Um, thank you, uh, Radhika Kumar. So, I mean, on that note, let's go for a quick break and take a peek at this evening's headline news. We'll be back, and as I say, we are in conversation today on International Women's Day with Radhika Kumar Swami. See you on the other side of the break. News First Newsline with Faraz Shaukatali. TV One. TV for life. Tear gas and water cannons fired to disperse protest by students of the University of Colombo. <laughs> International Women's Day celebrated worldwide. Women protest in Colombo. <laughs> National Election Commission assessing the possibility of conducting postal voting for the local government elections on the 28th and 31st of March. 30 ministerial portfolios still vacant says former minister Mahindananda.
News First, Newsline with Faraz Shaukut Ali. And welcome back to Newsline Live. It's a recording with uh, Radhika Kumar Swami as News First Marks International Women's Day. Uh, Radhika, uh, thank you very much again for being on the program. But um, I was going to ask you, a lot of women are involved in politics in Sri Lanka. Um, and, but they, it doesn't, doesn't reflect the numbers in Parliament, though. No, no. Or even in the councils. What happened to this business when they deployed this quota system, the 4,000 members of the local council went up to 8,000? And they said, I think they said 25% for women. Yes. What happened there? Well, I think uh, there were positive things that did happen. Many women did get uh, activated. Mm. But I think there was uh, some problem in administering it, um, some technical issues, bureaucratic issues, political parties objecting. Mm. So it didn't work out mm -hmm. Mm. Um, uh, properly. Uh, uh, and now there's, of course, a lot of pressure to remove it. But it did expose a lot of women to politics. Mm. Uh, and uh, many people, women's groups who work on the ground, say that it was a positive uh, aspect to it. But all the political parties object to, mm. to it, practically. What about social media? You see a lot of uh, negativity on social media, you know. Uh, and there are laws now, I suppose, as well. Mm. Uh, but uh, women tend to get harassed mm. um, in social media. Do you think social media has actually helped the cause of women's rights? Well, I think social media in any cause has its very positive. It brings groups together. It creates communities. Uh, people do uh, text each other. They use Twitter. So there is a sense of creating communities, but it's also a way of actually attacking and harassing people. And the international community now is uh, actually putting forward a draft uh, convention on cyber crimes, where hate speech and harassment and sexual harassment mm. are all being put forward um, to be dealt with. Now the model is: Do you these big tech companies say, okay, we will self-regulate? Mm. All right. So they want to self-regulate. They will set up committees or commissions, and those committees and commissions will self-regulate. Mm. Uh, but others are saying that we can't rely on tech companies. Look at Elon Musk and Twitter. Are they, he's not self-regulating. Mm. So what you want is a international convention with an international uh, monitoring mechanism that can respond to situations where women are being harassed. Mm -hmm. So we would have self-regulation, national regulation, and international regulation, where, where there is constant harassment of women that's taking place on social media. But of course, the free speech people are very, very weary of this being misused. Is it, or is it almost a fine line? It is a fine line, because where you would, uh, where you would say there's freedom of expression and where you would say there is hate speech, it is difficult sometimes. As you know, look at what they've done to the ICCPR. Now you yes. mentioned the word ethnic in any form, even as a, uh, as a political issue, they, ar they arrest you on it mm. in Sri Lanka, mm. as you know. So it can be a negative thing. So if you say anything on the ethnic issue under, uh, which might not even be very, uh, anything to do with hate, you then leave yourself open to be uh, arrested. And do you think Social media regulation might help? I think there has to be social media regulation, but whether it should be through uh, self-regulation or by government regulation is the issue. Do you think the rights people will have lots to say? Then? They will if it's the government or international. They would say that it would mm -hmm. be an issue. But hate speech is also a rights issue Indeed. to be, to be, to be uh, aroused in that way. Mm. So there has to be a way of working out the system. But that, during the Aragalia, the, the f women's brigade were rather well represented, I thought. Well, women uh, were very yeah, well were represented very, in very Aragalia. Well, yeah. It was a very, Aragalia was a transformative moment in our history. Mm. We, we've lost it, but it was a very transformative woman. Very, women were very active. But uh, down towards sort of um, uh, this, Sri Lanka had this sort of hashtag Me Too moment, I suppose. Uh, but uh, it's gone 
it's like it's lost the fizz. It's lost the um, yeah. It's lost the fizz. I don't know about the energy, but it shows how deep-seated sexual harassment is. Mm -hmm. What what are your thoughts on that here in Sri Lanka? Well, I think sexual harassment exists in Sri Lanka in a very big way, and people don't even recognize it in some ways. Uh, but I think uh, we have to also deal with it in a much more multi, not only in terms of shaming and naming and prosecuting, which is of course necessary. Mm. But women, you know, more and more as I do my work, uh, as you know, I was the first special rapporteur on violence against women. I realized that women don't come forward, as mm. you know, like the Me Too movement died out. Uh, and even in uh, international cases, we have all these frameworks for, for violence, but women don't come forward. Mm. So you have to step back and say, why don't women come forward? Uh, and how do we support them if they don't come forward? How do we deal with the situation when they don't come forward? So you have to have within the workplace uh, mm. kind of uh, uh, training or uh, conversations that allow women to feel safe. Mm. The, and that relies on the leadership of the company or the leadership of, uh, of uh, corporations mm. that they would create a safe non-hostile environment for their women mm. and all the managers and leaders are also committed to committing that safe non-hostile uh, so it's not only about gay women coming forward and naming and shaming people and uh, whatever mm. you know it's about creating non-hostile conditions of work focus no in, in Sri Lanka even for these women who came forward I mean so they would name a man yeah. So all his friends get really worked up and say, look at this terrible thing this woman has done. And uh, so she she is now rejected by the whole part. This is such a small society. Mm. All his friends, there's all kinds of tension. Uh, and uh, so what we need is really not only to have this coming forward, but to make sure that workplaces create safe and non-hostile envir environments for women. I better ask this before. Um before I get booted out. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about this reform to the Muslim Marriage and Divorce mm -hmm. Act. Mm -hmm. um, what is this all about? Is it needed? Is reform of this MMDA needed? Well, you know, if you, there's this famous uh, thinker in uh, India who said that what we did during colonial time was to make a pact with the British, mm. right? Basically, you can deal with the public life. We also will go to parliament. We'll have corporations. All your model of public life, we will imitate. Mm. Mm. But the private life, you leave to us. So the private life, marriage, so there was distinction between public and private. The private was left to the ethnic groups, to the religious uh, groups, etc. So then we have these laws that are now forever they may have been written in the 16th century, but they're forever uh, containing the lives of women. And women themselves are living different lives. Mm. So they have to change to come up. But the issue is, how do we bring this change? Now, if you're a majority, such as in Indonesia or in Tunisia or whatever, yeah. the government moves and it is changed. But if you're in a situation where this group is Muslim group, or even the Tersev Alame Fatama groups is a minority, the government moving against them is also politically problematic because it looks like a move. I mean, a lot of people, uh, a lot of the most racist people I know want to support one law, one uh, country, mm. because they want to just wipe out the Muslim identity, you see? So you don't want to do that either. Mm. So the issue is let the Muslim community, especially Muslim women, be your guide. That's for me. What do they want? Mm. And they have been very clear. The Muslim women in Sri Lanka have not stayed at home. They have been very clear what they want. That they want certain aspects of this. They want to keep the law, but certain aspects taken out. Mm -hmm. You know, such as uh, child, uh, child marriage, various uh, clauses. So it's uh, reforms that are welcome. Yes, mm. reform the law, not get rid of it. What about this other matter then? You know, in, in the former conflict areas and so on, 
which I suppose not eats. There's a lot of heads of household who mm. are women mm. because their men have probably been killed mm. uh, or whatever. Um, what about them? What kind of support should the uh, central government be doing for these uh, spe special group of people basically there? Well, you know, this I can talk from around the world because, as you know, I've gone to armed conflict situations around the world. The problem is that we have this one model of, of how women heads of households or women in situations uh, of armed conflict should live their economic lives. Yeah. So, so there's this model that comes mainly uh, from Western countries and donor communities that you support women entrepreneurs and you provide them with livelihoods. So, and let them, you know, cook or be barbers or, you know, now we have form LCT carders have all be opened beauty salons because they're all trained to be beauticians. Mm. Or, mm. You know, so training them in livelihood. But there's no plan of, you know, why don't we train them in computers? Why, why don't we integrate them into the larger development plan for the area? Mm. So instead of this livelihood training on how to cook and open a kade, we should think much more broadly about how these women will be integrated into the larger development plan of the, of the region and the country. And what happens is these women take microfinances mm. to get through the day, to have, uh, and then they end up in debt. And then they commit suicide. A large number of women have committed suicide. So there's no, uh, to some extent, you have to uh, incorporate them in a larger plan of development and mm. also bring them up to date, to train them in computers. Do you see uh, vast areas of, uh, or vast acreages of uh, land being converted into huge uh, sort of uh, IT centers, if you like, in, in the fields of Kilinochi? <laughs> I don't know about because lab. I went there, uh -huh. and it was—it's basically barren. Yeah. But it's a very fertile land. Yes. Um, I mean, there's there's a company that's making cheese, I think, somewhere there, and there's another company that's a dairy company, mm. and and these are all doing well. Mm. But by and large, those areas—I uh, know the devastation of the war left left the land barren and grey, but today it's green and it's lush green. And it's a pity that uh, the people there don't seem to have an opportunity. Yes, well, I mean, I think agricultural um, incentives and policies should work there. But recent uh, uh, research is showing that actually people are leaving the agricultural sector uh, and they're coming into the cities or they're mm. going abroad. Mm. So you want to teach your, uh, your people, young people especially, the skills they will need to do that as well, not only to grow vegetables and onions, and, which they can do, that's a choice, but they should also have the skills they want to migrate to the cities, and which seems to be the choices they're making now, as you know, they are migrating, and people are worried actually that we will, that the food sector will, will be a problem in the near future. Mm. So if people are doing that, if they're migrating to the cities, if they're migrating internationally, you also want to uh, give them the skills to do that. And finally, we've got like one minute. Radhika Kumar Swami, on International Women's Day, what advice would you give young women? And look, perhaps looking back on your own career, what would you perhaps do differently if you were given half the chance? Well, I think uh, what, we, what I would tell young women uh, is that you should always uh, follow your dream, whatever it is, whether it's to marry and have children, or whether it is to, f uh, to go ahead and f uh, fight for rights, whether it's to join corporations, because I think people who don't do that uh, will uh, later on regret it, uh, and then life may not be as pleasant. Radhika Kumar Swami, thank you very much for being on Newsline Live. Thank and you. that's the way it was, ladies and gentlemen, on International Women's Day. It's now time for the primetime news. Take care and uh, have a great evening as much as you can. And of course, God bless you all.